Hello, my name is Dr. Ominde, and I'm going to discuss the gross anatomy of the face. So, the face extends superiorly from the hairline and inferiorly to the chin and the base of the mandible. On each side, the face extends to the auricle, so hairline to the chin and base of mandible and sideways to the auricles. The forehead is therefore common for both the scalp and face. Part of the forehead is uh, part of scalp and the forehead is also part of the face. So the skin of the face, it is richly polarized. It has very many blood vessels and clinically this is important because you need to understand that if there is a cut wound due to trauma of the face, these blood vessels can cause profuse bleeding but the good side of it is because of rich vascularization, healing will be very rapid. Skin of the face is also rich in sebaceous glands and sweat glands and these sebaceous glands are actually what keep the skin oily and that can cause acne, especially in adults and um, adolescents. The sweat glands help to regulate body temperature. By now you know that when you produce sweat and sweat evaporates on the surface of the skin, evaporation causes cooling. The face has muscles and these are muscles of facial expression which lie in the superficial fascia. So they are superficial muscles, basically. And these muscles are mesodermal in origin, and they come from the second brachial arc of second pharyngeal arch. And all the derivatives of the second pharyngeal arch are usually supplied by the seventh cranial nerve, which we call the facial nerve. So these are examples of muscles of the face. You have a, a, a frontal belly of occipitalis muscle, occipital frontalis muscle, the, it's frontal belly. Remember, occipital frontalis is a scalp muscle. Occipitalis frontalis, so it runs through the scalp. So the frontal belly part of it is on the uh, forehead, and then um, orbicularis oculi, which is a circumferential muscle along, around the eye. Then we have orbicularis oris, circumferential around the mouth. We have the platysma muscle, the subcutaneous muscle from the neck. Uh, it's found in the neck and the lower face. You have the vaccinator muscle here, okay, that helps you to remove food from accumulating from the vestibule of the mouth. There's mentalis, there's nasaris here. You have the, the veta labi superioris and the veta labi inferioris here. So we have very many muscles. You have processoras, sorry, processoras. You have auricularis superior, auricularis anterior, auricularis posterior. So all these are muscles of facial expression. So we'll just discuss quite a few of them. For example, orbicularis oculi. This muscle is a constraint, concentric muscle, and you have three uh, parts. You have the orbital part that originates from the medial, part, medial papable ligament, and it actually helps you to close your eyelids tightly. Then the palpebral part from the lateral part of the palpable, medial papable ligament usually helps you to close the eyelids, but gently. So you close it gently with the palpebral part and close it forcefully with the um, orbital part. Then the orbicularis oculi also has a lacrimal part that originates from the lacrimal bone and the lacrimal fascia, and this usually helps to dilate the lacrimal sac. Orbicularis oris is a circumferential muscle around the mouth, originating from the maxilla above the incisor teeth and inserts on the skin of the lip, and it will help with the closing of the mouth. The vaccinator muscle has upper fibers from uh, maxilla, the lower fibers from the mandible, and the middle fibers from the pterygo mandibular raphae. And the main action of the vaccinator muscle is to prevent food from accumulating in the vestibule of the mouth. Remember I showed you the vaccinator muscle here. This is the vaccinator muscle. So when it contracts, it prevents food from accumulating in the vestibule. The vestibule is a part of the oral cavity that is um, inside the oral cavity, but external to the teeth, okay? Then we have the platysma. Platysma originates from the upper part of the pectoral and deltoid fascia, and it goes upwards and inserts on the base of the mandible and the skin of the lower face and the lip. So what's the action of platysma? It helps to release pressure of skin. It releases pressure of skin on the subjacent vein. So you have subcutaneous veins just under the platysma. So when it contracts, it's able to 
give that pressure onto these veins. And when it contracts this way, remember muscles contract from insertion towards the origin, it will lead to the depression of mandible and depression of the angle of the mouth downwards. So to make the angle of the mouth to move downwards and the mandible to uh, depress, that's the action of platysma. What's enough supply of the face? Remember we said motor supply, all muscles of facial expression are supplied by facial nerve because they come from the second pharyngeal arc and facial nerve is the nerve of the second brachial arc. So you can see, you can appreciate this is facial nerve as it leaves the stylomastoid foramen, then we find it within the substance of the parotid before it now divides into five branches, the temporal branch going upwards to innervate muscles around um, above the ear. Then you have zygomatic buccal to come the uh, vaccinator, for example, and then you have mandibular branch and the masseter. So all these are going to innervate the muscles of facial expression, which we have already discussed. Occipital frontalis, this is the frontalis, belly uh, of the occipital frontalis muscle. And this um, frontal belly of occipital frontalis helps you to raise the eyebrows. So you can see it help. it's a muscle of facial expression because it gives that expression of surprise or horror. So that's um, the frontal belly of occipital frontalis. Again, remember you have facial nerve, the temporal branch of facial nerve that will help um, with that. So it will innervate the frontal part of occipital frontalis and cause that movement. What's the sensory supply to the face? Data is facial. Sensory is mainly by trigeminal, which is the fifth cranial nerve. So the upper part of the face is innervated by ophthalmic division of trigeminal, where you have your supratrochlear and supraorbital nerves. We also have infratrochlear at that portion, which is from ophthalmic, and you have the external nasi nerve on the external part of the nose. The middle portion is innervated by maxillary division of trigeminal, and this has the zygomatical temporal, zygomatical facial hair, and the infraorbital nerves. And the lower part of the face is innervated by branches of the mandibular division of trigeminal. You have the buccal nerve here, the mental nerve, which is a terminal branch of, um, of the mandibular division. But we also have um, other nerves like the transverse cervical nerve that may send some branches, but mainly is by branches of trigeminal nerve. What's the blood supply to the face? Just like the skull, the face is a site for external and internal carotid artery communication. So external carotid and internal carotid communicate in the scalp and also in the face. So what are the branches of external carotid artery to the face? Facial artery. So facial artery is here. So it will give inferior labial artery, superior labial artery, then continue going towards the medial aspect of the eye, it will give a nasal branch before it terminates by giving angular artery. So those are the branches of facial arteries. So facial arteries from external carotid artery, inferior labial, superior labial, external nasal, and angular. Then we also have going upwards, it terminates by dividing into superficial temporal and maxillary. So we have superficial temporal that will give some branches to the face, then anteriorly from remember the internal carotid is intracranially but it will give ophthalmic artery to the eye and this ophthalmic artery will give supratrochlear and supraorbital arteries that will supply the upper part of the face therefore the face is a site for external and internal carotid artery anastomosis facial artery and superficial temporal from external carotid and supratrochlear and supraorbital from ophthalmic which is from internal carotid artery so it's at the medial angle of the eye specifically where you have the communication between internal and external carotid artery communication that is the angular branch of facial as well as supratrochlear and supraorbital arteries from ophthalmic or internal carotid artery what's the venous drainage of the face the veins will correspond to the arteries which we've mentioned and they usually drain onto um, common facial vein and retromandibular vein so this uh, veins usually if you're to look here this is your facial vein okay this is facial vein and this is your retromandibular vein so what happens superficial temporal and maxillary veins will join and form your retromandibular vein and that's where facial vein drains 
so there's usually communication between these facial veins and intracranial structures. For example, the supraorbital vein will drain into superior ophthalmic vein, and those will communicate with the pterygoid plexus. We also have um, this superior ophthalmic vein and the pterygoid plexus of vein communicating with the cavina sinus. So you have, when you have infection in the face, through um, supraorbital and supratrochlear veins, through that would drain into ophthalmic vein, okay, and these usually communicate with the cavina sinus. So you can spread infection from the face, the middle part of the face, into the cavina sinus intracranially. So that's why you need to understand that facial veins, uh, drain, facial vein drains into common facial and retromandibular, but it also communicates with pterygoid venous plexus and cavinous plexus, which are intracranially, and that means you can spread infection from external to internal parts. So this just shows you that you have facial vein here, okay, and this is superficial temporal veins. This is your retromandibular vein, okay? So what's the lymphatic drainage of the face? The upper part, just like the scalp, will drain into um, preauricular or parotid lymph nodes. The middle territories will drain into submandibular lymph nodes, and the lower part will drain into the submental lymph nodes. So the upper part, preocular or parotid lymph nodes, the middle part will drain into submandibular on the sides of the mandible and below the mandible. And then the um, lower part will drain onto submental lymph nodes. So what's the applied anatomy? We have what you call trigeminal neuralgia. Okay, so mainly involving maxillary and mandibular divisions of trigeminal, where you have excruciating pain in the distribution of the nerve. Then we have what you call Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is facial nerve palsy, which is lower motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve. So in your neuroanatomy series, you'll understand what is upper neuron and lower motor neuron. So what happens in Bell's palsy? The affected side is motionless. Remember, if your muscles cannot contract, there'll be no movement. So there'll be no movement on that side. Um, the patient is not able to form wrinkles on that side. You lose nasolabial folds on the affected side. You can't close your eye because obicularis ocula is not working. Smile when you ask the patient to smile. If there is Bell's palsy or facial nerve palsy, the mouth will move to the um, normal side. Then during chewing, food will accumulate in the vestibule because vaccinator muscle is not working. Its main function is to prevent food from accumulating in the vestibule, and then the patient will be drooling saliva. So all these occur in Bell's palsy, which is lower motor neuron lesion. But if it is upper motor lesion, it's only the lower part of the face that will be affected because the upper part is receiving control from both sides of the brain. So upper motor lesion, if it's only right upper motor lesion, only the lower part of the um, face will be affected. So the lymphatic drainage of the scalp, remember from the scalp lecture we said, uh, anterior part will drain into preauricular or parotid nodes and posterior part will drain into mastoid and occipital lymph node. But the face, uh, superior part, preauricular, middle part, submandibular, and the lower part will drain into submental. So all these eventually come to deep cervical lymph nodes. Okay, so anterior scalp and forehead to the submandibular lymph nodes. So you can see the parotid lymph nodes here, the mastoid lymph nodes, the occipital lymph nodes, the submandibular and submental lymph nodes. So all these drain the face and the scalp. So this just shows you the back of the scalp will drain into occipital nodes and all these will get into the deep cervical lymph nodes. This is to show you Bell's palsy. When you ask the patient to smile, the face moves towards the uh, normal side where muscles are working. This side is motionless. This is the danger area of the face. We said if you draw a triangle involving the medial aspect of the eye up to the upper lip, this is the danger area of the face. So you can spread infection from this area intracranially into the cavina sinus because facial vein communicates with ophthalmic veins. Thank you very much.